Thank you for inviting me to talk to you today and uh, good evening to all of you and congratulations that uh, you will be getting the vaccine pretty soon so that is uh, that is good news and clearly I, I know you have uh, you will have questions about uh, the vaccines and we'll be happy to discuss that later but I thought I will also start with the issues of transmission because I do understand that uh, there are at least some of uh, the medical students who have unfortunately got infected so uh, we will start with transmission and then go on to vaccines so as you know of course um, uh, this time last year just 12 months ago there was about 8,000 cases uh, of COVID-19 most of them in China indeed in one province in China but as you can see just 12 months later we have over 100 million cases and over 2 million deaths so this has been really a catastrophic experience uh, the virus itself is a enveloped RNA virus so uh, uh, and this is the viral envelope that you see here uh, and you see these spikes on the surface the viral RNA inside so given the fact that uh, it's an enveloped virus it means that these enveloped viruses like influenza, like HIV, they are more fragile compared to non-enveloped viruses, such as say rotavirus or enteroviruses, which survive for quite a long time out in the environment uh, and uh, say in, in water, for example. Uh, um, now, also, I just want to point out, and I will show you some evidence for that, that as you know, the, the diagnostic tests for uh, for this virus is the PCR, RT-PCR, which detects this viral RNA inside it. Uh, now you have to keep in mind that the detection of virus RNA does not necessarily mean this is infectious RNA because if the virus particle is disrupted, it is no longer infectious. And also once the virus particle is coated with antibody in, in the, you know, after about seven days after onset of illness, usually again the infectivity is is much lower and as i said uh, the transmission is primarily by the respiratory route rather than being a fecal oral or a waterborne infection now again I'm, I'm sure i don't have to tell you that viruses are obligate intracellular parasites meaning they have to replicate inside living cells uh, they attach to the, the cell surface which is a very specific interaction they replicate inside the cell and they get packaged into new virus particles and they come out to each infected cell can generate thousands of new virus particles. Uh, now, being an RNA virus, of course, when these viruses multiply inside the cell, uh, RNA viruses have a higher mutation rate. And that is why uh, we have some of the problems we have with things like HIV and influenza and also with um, coronaviruses. Although not uh, the mutation rates with coronaviruses is not as high as with uh, uh, HIV and influenza, but still, as you can see, it's going, it is posing us problems. Now, in terms of transmission and infectiousness, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to show you data from some of our own work, primarily to, to emphasize the need for you know, all of us to do systematic research. So um, this is very early, uh, at the end of January last year, uh, in collaboration with colleagues in China, we looked at the viral load, the quantity of virus in the upper respiratory tract of patients. So you can see the pattern, it is maximal at the time of onset of symptoms and it comes down. So I've just schematically illustrated it here. And indeed later we realized that even before the onset of symptoms, you can find infectious virus at quite high concentration. And when you look at the transmission epidemiological wise, you can see that most of the transmission, about 44% of transmission takes place before the onset of symptoms. And another 40 or 50% takes place in the next four days or so after the onset of symptoms. So most of the transmission is taking place before or soon after the onset of symptoms. And this is one of the reasons why it is so difficult to, to contain, to stop transmission. And another reason why it is so difficult to stop transmission is because a lot of infection is asymptomatic, about a third. And then a vast majority of it 
is mild. So it's only a very small proportion who are severe and would typically come to medical attention. Now, in contrast uh, to this, in the case of SARS in 2003, the viral load pattern was very different, meaning in the first few days after onset of symptoms, there was very little virus in the respiratory tract. And indeed, transmission did not start until, by and large, did not really start until after four or five days after onset of symptoms. And also, when you look at this iceberg, uh, it is standing on its head. So most of the infection with the SARS of 2003 was severe. Only a very small proportion was mild and indeed hardly any was asymptomatic. So that disease was visible, uh, very visible, and therefore you could identify patients. And as I told you, since transmission doesn't take place in this period, in the case of 2003 SARS, it was possible by early detection and diagnosis and getting patients into hospital and isolation to stop transmission. But clearly, this is uh, much more difficult to do with, uh, with uh, COVID-19. Now, another question, of course, is once a patient becomes symptomatic, how long are they infectious for? Because as you know, uh, the, the virus can be detected by PCR for a long time, can be many months indeed, that these patients are PCR positive. And one of the challenges uh, everybody had was how long do you have to keep these patients in hospital? When can you discharge them even after they have recovered? So as you might know, in the early stages, patients were being kept in hospital until there were two negative PCR results. But uh, so in, in response to this challenge, we did a study where we cultured the specimens from patients. So all these crosses are patients and viral load. You can see very, this is a logarithmic scale. So here you can see this is 1 million, 10 million, 100 million virus copies per ml. Uh, but when you culture these, even though the viral load may be quite high for quite a long time, infectiousness, meaning uh, being able to grow the virus, which is evidence of infectious live virus, is only in the first eight or nine days and only in those specimens which have a high viral load. So that led to the change in the discharge policy, uh, which basically says that in mild and asymptomatic patients, we can, uh, once they have symptomatically recovered, uh, you don't have to wait for negative PCRs. They can be discharged after around 10 days. I mean, in Sri Lanka, it's 14 days to be, added, uh, to be more careful. So as I said, a PCR positive, of course, is very important for diagnosis, but a continued PCR positive does not necessarily mean that the person continues to be infectious. Um, and as I said, the infectious virus is found early in the illness and in, in patients with high viral load or quantity. But keeping that in mind, you do have to keep in mind that, that in severely ill patients, you may have infectious virus for somewhat longer. And in immunocompromised patients, you can indeed have infectious virus for a very long time, sometimes um, you know, one, one month, two months or longer. So you really have to be careful about immunocompromised patients. Now, how is it transmitted? Um, I'm sure you know that it is transmitted by the respiratory route. And when somebody is infected, when they cough or sneeze, or even when you talk um, or sing or shout, you have these um, small droplets that are released from your mouth. And if uh, someone is infected, these droplets will be infectious. So you have the larger droplets, which of course they're heavy, they fall to the ground, usually within one or two meters. But the smaller droplets evaporate very quickly and they can more or less float in the air for quite a distance. However, uh, you also have to uh, keep in mind that the further away you are from the source of infection, in this case, this person, even these, these uh, small airborne particles get diluted. So the further away you are, the chance of receiving an infectious dose, a minimal infectious dose rapidly declines. So keep in mind that just a single virus particle, even an infectious virus particle is insufficient to initiate infection. You really have to have a minimal infectious dose and it is estimated to be <coughs> around 100 to 1000 uh, infectious virus particles. So, right, so, um, 
we will talk about what this implies in terms of reducing transmission. Now, another important question, of course, was what can you do to prevent these uh, infectious particles being shed? And what are the size of these particles that carry infectious virus? I see the large particles or the small particles. Um, indeed, we had started a study even before COVID came, looking at um, the, the particles released from patients' breath when they talk or when they breathe. Um, and of course, sometimes if they are coughing or sneezing. Uh, this study was started for influenza, but some of the patients who we recruited actually had coronaviruses, not, not COVID-19. As you know, there are other seasonal coronaviruses. There are four coronaviruses that are endemic in humans. So these people were having these coronaviruses. And you can see that um, the, the, uh, you can see evidence of virus in the large droplets as well as in the small droplets, right? So uh, the, the, when these people are breathing, they release both large infectious droplets and small infectious droplets. But the most important thing that we found is when the same patient wears a mask, a surgical mask, essentially the release of the large droplets as well as the small droplets really was largely eliminated. So, so really the wearing of surgical masks reduces dramatically the release of infectious virus from uh, an infected patient. So putting these together, what are the measures that reduce transmission? Um, clearly, distance and ventilation are crucial because, as I said, uh, because the large droplets and a high dose of these small droplets will occur only within a short, uh, short range, usually a couple of meters. So that's why most transmission occurs in that uh, type of range. Uh, so distance is protective good ventilation is protective. And this is again the same reason why outdoors, your chance of getting infected is, is very, very low. Uh, having said that, there have been a few examples of fairly long range transmission in very specific situations where airflow uh, is quite directional. So you can have long range transmission, but that is the exception rather than the rule. Then, as I said, a wearing of masks by the source patient reduces transmission. So you protect your neighbor. And particularly because, as I said, some people are asymptomatic. So any of us may be carrying the virus and without, without knowing it. So a wearing of a surgical mask is protective of other people. And also, of course, wearing a surgical mask has some protection for yourself. So that's why this is quite important. And then we know that uh, these infected uh, particle droplets can settle on surfaces, maybe, maybe on, on tabletops or uh, somebody may touch his infected person may touch his mouth and touch maybe a railing, a stainless steel, um, you know, railing on a bus or whatever it is. And the virus can get deposited there. And we know that the virus can survive live for a number of hours on these, particularly on smooth surfaces. It does not survive very long at all on things like paper or cloth uh, and, they, uh, and that type of surface, but on smooth uh, plastic surfaces, on glass, on stainless steel, it can survive for many hours. So obviously somebody else touching that infected surface and touching uh, their eyes or uh, nose or mouth can transmit infection to themselves. So this is why hand hygiene is important. Right, so these are the main routes of transmission and this is how we can reduce transmission. Uh, another feature of this virus, as was with SARS in 2003, is this phenomenon of super spreading events. So it is estimated, and there's also data from Hong Kong, uh, looking at using contact tracing. So all, all positive cases, there's in, uh, intense investigation of how many people they come into contact with. So most of the infected people actually don't transmit at all. A few of them may transmit to one other person or two people, and a very small minority transmit to large numbers of people. So for example, this is a, this is a cluster of almost 100 cases that took place uh, in, a, in, a, in a bar. So th there was a band who was singing in this bar, and uh, somebody in the band was infected. So obviously this guy was singing at the top of his voice and uh, large numbers of people who were in that um, area who came and went from that area got infected. 
So uh, these super spreading events do take place in, in the wrong places, indoors particularly, at the wrong time when the patient is most infectious and doing the wrong thing, like singing, uh, shouting loud or whatever it is, uh, and without uh, uh, personal protection like surgical masks. Right, so I now want to turn to vaccines, but I, I want to emphasize uh, something as well. I mean, um, whether it be vaccines or therapeutics, uh, COVID-19 is a, is, an in, is a disease. Most of the patients recover fairly uneventfully, right? So in that type of situation, when we talk about using therapeutic interventions, treatments, or for that matter, vaccines, you really have to be careful and design properly controlled, randomized clinical trials. So let me just show you. So let, let's assume, let's think that these these people are all people with disease. Let's say COVID nineteen. And now, if you want to prove that a treatment works, the only way you can do that, the only way you can do that, is by randomizing these into two groups: a treatment arm and a control arm. And um, ideally, that should be blinded, meaning the doctors and the healthcare workers should not know which one is receiving treatment and which one is not. And then you give the treatment. And of course, some people anyway are going to recover. So these green guys have recovered, right? Now, uh, hopefully what you're hoping to see is that in the treatment arm, more people recover. That is, that is what you want to show. But you have to keep in mind that it is quite possible that for many treatments, as we can see, uh, many of the early treatments that were initiated there was really no difference. So, of course, people recovered, but same number of uh, people recovered in the control arm as in the treatment arm. But indeed, it can be even worse. You may have a situation where the treatment you're going, giving is uh, delaying recovery or increasing mortality or hospitalization or, or outcomes. So this is why um, randomized clinical trials that are properly controlled are so important uh, in, in deciding with a new disease, deciding what works and what does not work. Uh, and this, of course, also applies to vaccines. So what about vaccines? Now, when you think about previous virus vaccines before COVID, as you know, there were a couple of approaches to uh, developing a vaccine. One is you can grow the virus in large quantity, inactivate it, and in inject it. And then you hope, you hope that the person uh, is going to develop antibody, which will neutralize the virus and may develop a cell mediated immune response that uh, kills virus infected cells and thereby controls the spread of the virus. Uh, and examples of that are, say, the rabies vaccine or the killed polio vaccine that is used now. Uh, a second approach is to take the infectious virus and attenuate it, make it weaker so that it can infect but is unable to cause disease. So examples of that are the measles vaccine or the old oral polio vaccine, the mumps, rubella, varicella vaccines. They are all attenuated virus vaccines. So they cause a mini disease, uh, I mean, a, a mini infection, but not uh, sufficiently virulent to cause disease. Or you can identify the critical protein that is protective and inject that protein. And examples of that is say the hepatitis B vaccine, the hepatitis, uh, the, the, the human papillomavirus vaccines. Then, of course, in the last few years, there were other emerging technologies that were developing and were tried out. So there is this RNA vaccine. So rather than inject the protein itself, you inject the messenger RNA that codes for the protein. And once this is injected into the cell, the messenger RNA is translated into protein, right? Uh, now, it's quite important to understand, as I'm sure you do, that RNA or messenger RNA will not get integrated into your or the patient's DNA. There is no way in the normal cell that RNA can get converted back to DNA. Uh, of course, there are viruses that do that, like HIV, but in a normal cell, you cannot convert RNA to DNA. And I, and I emphasize this because there's so much of conspiracy theories, which uh, one of them, which is to say that RNA vaccines will damage your DNA and 
uh, you know, your your genetic uh, de your genetic uh, genes can be um, made bad or mad, made, made abnormal. Now, of course, you can further go further upstream, and um, you can use DNA itself, and that will then injected into the cell will make RNA and will make the protein. Now, of course, theoretically, there is a possibility that such DNA may get integrated, but all evidence so far from DNA vaccines is that there is no such evidence of integration. But definitely, it's biologically impossible for RNA vaccines to uh, damage your DNA in that way. Alternatively, you can deliver the, the, the genetic information to make this protein of interest uh, using a viral vector. So you, you put the gene of interest into another virus and you inject it. The virus carries the uh, gene of interest into the cell and then it gets uh, translated into protein. So these are broadly the different approaches uh, for developing vaccines that were available. As I said, these ones, uh, inactivated virus vaccines, attenuated virus vaccines, viral protein vaccines were the classical approaches but RNA vaccines, DNA vaccines, um, um, viral vector vaccines had been in development for quite some time. So this is not something completely new that suddenly just started you know, last year. That also is important to keep in mind. So in these approaches, basically you're putting in the viral nucleic acid or the, the, the nucleic acid for the protein of interest and your cell itself becomes the vaccine factor. And this has some advantages because the, the vital protein of interest is now presented to the immune system in a very physiological way. Right, so this is the basic uh, approaches we can have to make vaccines. So how do COVID vaccines fit in? Uh, so we do have, uh, as you know, these RNA vaccines um, that have been developed for, for COVID and examples are the Moderna vaccine, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, there's another one, Sanofi, which is uh, still in development. Um, there are these uh, um, adenoviral vector vaccines. So the adenovirus is used as the vector to carry the, R the nucleic acid into the cell. And the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is going to be uh, administered to, uh, which is now available in Sri Lanka. And then there's the, the Russian vaccine also is a different uh, adenovirus, adenovirus 26. Janssen and Janssen again, adenovirus 26, and there's a Chinese vaccine, which is adenovirus 5. So all of them use the same principle, but because they use different adenoviruses to do the job, there are certain advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the advantages with the AstraZeneca, the chimp adenovirus, is that humans have no immunity to the chimpanzee adenovirus. So there is no prior immunity to, to, to basically interfere with the vaccination, whereas this Adenovirus 5 is a very common human infection. So if you use that as the vector, you are likely, if in, in people who have immunity to adenovirus 5, you may have blunting of the uh, vaccine response. Then, of course, you have the conventional inactivated vaccines, and there are two, uh, well, a couple of Chinese vaccines and, and an Indian vaccine, uh, and probably others that use that approach. And finally, you have the viral protein vaccines. <coughs> uh, Novavax uh, is is now pretty, uh, I mean, the, the phase three clinical trials were announced also. So a number of these vaccines have phase three clinical trial data. Some of them, a few of them published, but um, a number of them announced. Uh, so we don't know the exact details of them. So, I, but I'll go through that in, in due course now. <coughs> I also want to just go through the stages of vaccine development because this is uh, quite a careful process. So you have the preclinical development where the vaccines are tested out in experimental models, uh, in animal models for safety and immunogenicity. And if that is okay, then you go into phase one clinical trials where small numbers of people are used. Uh, 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 the vaccine is tested on them and the primary uh, uh, objective is to test for safety and also to optimize the dose and to measure the immune response, usually the antibody response. Once that is okay, then you go to phase two where you scale it up. So now hundreds of people are uh, immunized 
uh, in subgroups, which may include elderly, et cetera. And again, you're looking at safety and immunogenicity at a larger scale. And, and then you move on to phase three clinical trials when thousands of people are given the vaccine on the one hand and the placebo on the other, because now you're actually also you're looking at safety, but you are now looking at efficacy as well. So that you're you're looking at the vaccine protecting people from getting infected and diseased compared to the placebo arm, uh, who in, in theory should not be protected. And also you're looking for more rare side effects because now you're having thousands of people undergoing the vaccine. Once the, the phase three data is available, then there is um, it's um, uh, looked at by regulatory authorities and uh, its use may be authorized. So you can see the pipeline of COVID vaccines. I mean, there are over 200 vaccine uh, candidates that started in phase one. At the moment, there are about 35, 26 have gone to phase two, blah, blah, blah. So that, uh, and you know, a much smaller number have been fully approved and, and a few have been actually abandoned because of lack of uh, effic effectiveness and, and various other problems. So one of the questions is uh, people say that, well, it normally takes uh, 10, you know, many, many years to, to develop a vaccine because as I told you, you had to go through these different stages, the experiment, animal experimental stage, the phase one, phase two, phase three stages. So how come these COVID vaccines have been developed in such a rush, if you like, or, or such a short time. And the reason, of course, is that clearly COVID was a huge uh, public health problem globally. And because of that, there was a lot of funding to basically overlap these stages. So without waiting for the phase, first and foremost, I should point out that the vaccine uh, approaches are not completely new. Uh, as I said, you know, the RNA vaccines, I mean, people say these are new vaccines indeed. They're, they're new in terms of being the first RNA vaccines to be licensed in humans. But RNA vaccines have been tried out for a number of years for influenza, for various other infections. So these have been in developed for some time. So the platforms already were being tried out in humans in phase one, phase two for, for other infections. Then once they, they were developed and deployed, the phase one and phase two was overlapped uh, and the phase three before waiting for the phase one and two to completely finish once it was it, it was clear that uh, the vaccines were safe uh, and were immunogenic then the phase three trial started and then most importantly even before the phase three results were available in other words knowing whether the vaccine was effective or not the funding was made available to the companies to produce at scale in thousands and millions of doses, this vaccine. Uh, because if that was not the case, I mean, the phase three clinical data was only available uh, in, in December, right? If we had waited, or I'm saying if the world had waited till December to start scaling up manufacture, we would not have had uh, enough doses uh, to be distributed anywhere for another six to six months or, or so. So this is why, because all these phases were telescoped, that is what allowed the, the vaccine to be developed and deployed in such a, in a fa such a fast time scale. And, and indeed, I think that is a, it's a huge um, ach achievement for, for science, I would say. Uh, now here I have summarized uh, some of the data from the vaccines that have had the you know, greatest uh, amount of data available. Uh, and uh, let me close this, yeah. So uh, some of them are the RNA vaccines, uh, the Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna. Then we have the adenovirus vaccines, uh, the AstraZeneca, uh, the uh, Russian um, Sputnik V, the Johnson and Jan Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Uh, we have the protein subunit vaccine from Novavax, two inactivated, uh, three inactivated vaccines. Um, you can see the reported efficacy, you know, ranging from 90%, 70%, etc. But but you have to keep in mind that you cannot blindly compare these percentages of efficacy because the efficacy uh, in a particular vaccine would depend on the population in which it was tested, 
and also depends on the endpoint. So for example, is your endpoint uh, moderate disease, severe disease, mild disease? Because what we can see from the data is that the vaccines are more effective at preventing against severe disease than against very, very mild disease. So depending on what your endpoint, you may have slightly different, uh, uh, you know, what I'm saying is you cannot blindly compare these, um, uh, these efficacy numbers. Another important issue to consider is the uh, number of doses. So most of these vaccines require two doses, uh, but one, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, so the clinical trials were done with a single dose, although they are now also testing out two doses. The cold chain is also an important consideration. These RNA vaccines have to be stored in ultra cool temperatures, so that can be difficult in certain situations. Uh, most of the other vaccines can be uh, stored at normal refrigeration temperatures, which is what we use for, you know, most of the routine vaccines. And uh, a number of, well, a couple of them, the data has been published. So that is uh, the Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, and the Sputnik V, the data has been published already. Uh, some of these others, the data has been announced, but still pending publication. Uh, and of course, some, again, some of the others, um, the data has been submitted to regulatory authorities in different countries and uh, different uh, regulatory authorities have approved them for emergency use. Now, this is just to show you some of the clinical trial data said, and this is from the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. So you can see the placebo arm, the people who got the placebo. Now, obviously they wouldn't have known whether they got the active vaccine or the placebo, but then when they were followed up, the data was available and decoded then you know who got the placebo, who got the active vaccine. And you can see the, the, the numbers of uh, cumulative numbers of people who get infected continues to go up in the placebo arm. In the vaccine arm, you can see it continues to go up till about day 12. Then the two curves start to separate. And this is exactly what you would expect theoretically, because it takes a number of days, a week or two for the vaccine to elicit an immune response. And you can now see, and you can see it more magnified here, the, the, the two arms are separating out. And uh, as you know, the, the uh, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine had quite good um, efficacy. And not just in healthy young adults, but also in older people, in people who had uh, other underlying comorbidities, for example. And uh, this is the AstraZeneca vaccine. It's uh, obviously you'll be interested in this because this is what uh, is being given in, in, in Sri Lanka. So again, you can see the after the second dose now, again, you have a period uh, and after which you have the, the, the two arms separating out. So the, the control arm was a meningococcal vaccine uh, and the test arm was the active vaccine. Uh, and again, uh, in, all these, in all these trials, I'm just showing you the data from the AstraZeneca trial, there is very detailed uh, information on, on the side effects. So most of the side effects are relatively mild, chills, fatigue, very small numbers of people who had fever uh, and headache, joint pain, malaise, etc. Uh, very few serious side effects. And, and indeed, uh, I will come back to that uh, later, but you have to keep in mind that by now, these vaccines, the Pfizer, uh, Moderna, AstraZeneca have been given to millions of people in certainly in the US, in the UK, uh, in Israel, and in a number of uh, European countries. So clearly there are no uh, large numbers of serious side effects. Now, uh, with any vaccine, it is very important to monitor, even though you have done your phase two and phase three trials, once you start um, rolling out vaccines at scale, you may begin to see rare side effects. And therefore, it is very important to have uh, monitoring as your vaccine program so rolls out uh, to look for whether there are any unexpected uh, side effects. So I'm just showing you the website from Public Health England, uh, and they have an continually updated website that uh, gives the, 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 the reports on side effects uh, from these vaccines. Now, I'm afraid you probably can't uh, read all this. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to leave the slides to you uh, for you to look at in due course, but essentially what, and this is directly taken from the, from the UK website, where as they say, both the you know, Pfizer and the AstraZeneca vaccines in, in uh, 
these are the clinical trial data, but then subsequently monitored uh, in the population, by and large, uh, have had only very mild side effects. Uh, there have been allergic reactions, uh, a few uh, severe allergic reactions, such as anaphylaxis, mainly uh, in people who previously had a history of anaphylaxis uh, with the Pfizer, uh, the Moderna, and also the AstraZeneca as well, to, um, maybe to a lesser extent. And to be honest, with any vaccine, you may have uh, allergic side effects. But even anaphylaxis, as you know, can be treated completely effectively, uh, but it is advisable to, to remain in the vicinity of a healthcare facility, particularly for people who have an allergic history, an anaphylactic history. Now, mild allergy, like food allergies and, and just a mild allergic history is not really a contraindication to receive the vaccine. There have been a few reports of Bell's palsy uh, following some of these vaccines. Again, very rare. Now, then again, there have been reports of uh, from Norway and Scandinavian countries of deaths in very old, uh, frail, elderly people. You, you have to keep in mind that when you're uh, intervening, when you're giving any treatment, uh, any vaccine or any treatment to people who are quite frail and quite old, just and, and you're doing this to millions of people, definitely there are people who are going to die within seven to 10 days after whatever time you want to draw the line because, I mean, people do die, unfortunately. So you cannot necessarily jump to the conclusion that just because somebody died a few days after getting the vaccine, that the vaccine was responsible for the death. You have to compare that with the expected deaths in that population, that type of a population uh, that would happen Anyway, so again, uh, in spite of those reports from Norway, certainly in the UK, the USA and elsewhere, there has been no signal of uh, increased mortality in the, um, in the elderly as well. Right, so the title of this talk was Light at the End of the Tunnel. So, uh, and uh, one of the, I suppose the Israel is the place where the vaccine has been deployed uh, to the largest extent of their population. So about 80% uh, of those over 60 years old have received at least one dose and 78% and have received two doses, you know, by, by uh, January. And you can see the, the curves uh, of um, cases and hospitalization. This is cases and this is hospitalization. So let's look at hospitalization. So you can see um, these going up. Uh, and, and then, and, and of course, the dark line is the over 60s. So you can see the, 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 the hospitalization rate in the over 60s coming down. But of course, uh, these rates can come down because of other reasons, because of interventions. There is a lockdown, for example. But these lockdowns should affect both the elderly as well as the younger age populations. But you can see now that these curves, the, the elderly uh, and the, the over 60 and the under 60 population, the curves were quite similar. And, and from after the second dose, you can see the curves begin to separate. So the, the, the rate of hospitalization in the older population is going down at a steeper rate than the younger. Again, this is no proof, but it's certainly quite promising, uh, suggesting that the vaccine at population scale now is beginning to have effect. Now, so, so far, the, uh, the story with the vaccines has been spectacular, I would say. I mean, to be honest, you know, in uh, six months ago, uh, if, uh, you know, somebody were to tell me that we would have vaccines with supposed 90% efficacy in protection, uh, that would have been fantastic. I mean, even 70% protection would have been fantastic uh, six months ago. So what are the current knowledge gaps? Firstly, what is the duration of protection? Because remember, most of these trials have been, the, the readouts have been within two or three months after the vaccines have been given, because it's been such an urgent issue to, to, to get the results. Uh, the second is, do the vaccines prevent transmission? And then what about these virus mutants and the effect on vaccine immunity? So let us look at duration of protection. So this is again data from the AstraZeneca trial. And, and as you might know, I mean, the AstraZeneca trial, one of the clinicians leading that trial is indeed a Sri Lankan, uh, Maheshi Ramasamy. 
Um, so, uh, so this is data from the immune, the antibody uh, data from that AstraZeneca trial. Uh, and, and you can see that, you know, all age groups, there's very good antibody protection following the vaccine, but, and the antibody seems to last for two months, but obviously the duration is still not long enough. Uh, presumably more and more data will be coming in. So uh, we have been looking at the, the natural duration of antibody, neutralizing antibody. This is virus killing antibody in patients who have recovered from COVID-19. So this is the data from uh, some 200 and almost 300 uh, serum samples of people who have recovered from COVID. Uh, and uh, so you can see that the antibody response is lasting well, well over 200 days. And you can extrapolate that to, to estimate it'll last well over a year. And uh, we can also see that the, the peak antibody level and the duration of antibody also depends on severity. So uh, people with severe disease and mild disease, um, you have uh, easily antibody lasting for more than a year. But in asymptomatic infections, the numbers are smaller, but um, it does appear that the vaccine immunity may be waning faster. But you have to keep in mind that even when the detectable neutralizing antibody comes down, you still have immune memory cells, right? So the immune system does have memory so that if these people, even when these antibody levels come down, uh, when they meet the infection again, they will have a anamnestic response, a booster response in effect. So they may still well be protected. And in addition to that, this is only neutralizing antibody we know that there's a T cell response as well, which is protective. And we know from the example of SARS in 2003, that people who recovered from SARS in 2003, even now, they still have good T cell responses, even though their antibody responses appear to have gone down. So, it, uh, and the other point from, from this particular study is that the older people over 60 were made as good antibody responses as the under 60 age group. So it doesn't appear to be the case that the older population, which is the one who is most susceptible to severe disease and complications, uh, are compromised in their immune response. Right, now do vaccines prevent transmission? Um, so you have to keep in mind that the endpoints of the vaccine trial was protection from disease, right? That was what was measured, not prevention of transmission. If you think about it, it's extremely difficult to, to, to measure prevention of transmission. So we cannot assume that these vaccines that reduce disease will necessarily reduce transmission to a comparable degree. Uh, now, they probably will reduce transmission, but just because say the Pfizer vaccine reduces uh, disease by 90%, it doesn't mean that it may reduce transmission by 90%. So uh, that data is still awaited. Um, right, so I, since I'm running out of time, I'll just uh, quickly go over this. So I think, uh, Given the fact that until we have this data on the impact of transmission, we do, on the one hand, need to continue our, our, our protective, um, our personal protective measures and social distancing measures. We cannot assume that just because um, you know you, somebody is vaccinated or people are vaccinated that they may not be transmitting infection within their families to their elderly relatives, etc. Nor can you assume that just because you had vaccine, you can travel. Of course, you can travel. You will be protected. But you cannot assume that that person is not asymptomatically carrying the virus and he doesn't need quarantine. So these things are, you know, still uh, are open uh, questions and we don't know the answers to them. So vaccines do seem to protect from disease and from severe disease. But uh, whether they protect from asymptomatic infection and transmission is still unclear. So now quickly, uh, of course, um, we have, I mean, it was expected being an RNA virus that this virus will also undergo mutation. And one of the important sites of mutation is this, the, the spike protein, that is these surface proteins of the, of the virus binding to the receptor on the cell, which is ACE2. Uh, and this is a schematic of this. And as you can see, some of these mutations, which I'll talk about are right at the surface of the spike protein. This is where, the spike protein binds to the receptor, right? Uh, so one of the uh, earliest variants or mutant viruses, mind you, mutations have been taking place from almost for almost a year. RNA viruses mutate, but 
The point is most of those mutations had no biological effect except uh, around March or April there was one particular variant that appeared which is the 614 uh, mutation which was more transmissible and that rapidly spread worldwide. Uh, but then after that there was nothing much of biological interest until the, U, the, the virus that was detected in the UK which is called the B117 virus. So that has a number of mutations uh, also at, at this spike receptor binding domain. So uh, the data from the UK suggests that these viruses are 50 to 70 percent more transmissible. They have a higher viral load in the upper respiratory tract. There is some hint there may be an increase in severity. Uh, but the good news is that the antibody from patients and uh, the serum from vaccinees efficiently neutralizes the virus. So the antibody, so the vaccine and past infection will protect from reinfection. Uh, and uh, I, I think we can skip over this. Now, uh, there was another uh, variant that was detected in South Africa, which has one of the same mutations uh, here, this 501 mutation, which was associated with increased transmissibility, but now has a, another mutation, this 484. And here, there again seems to be evidence of increased transmission but no evidence of increased severity. But the bad news is that there does seem to be a reduction in the protection uh, from antibody, from past infections and from vaccine, uh, uh, vaccinated people. Now, what you see here is, this is the mutant virus, this yellow virus in South Africa. Uh, and, and you can see that it was hardly detectable in August and September in late September, October, you begin to see this and within just a matter of two months, it has now become the dominant virus in South Africa. So clearly suggesting that this has a transmission advantage. Uh, and indeed, a similar independent mutation uh, virus, again carrying the same 484 mutation, has independently arisen in Brazil. And more recently, the UK variant has also acquired this 484 mutation. So you can see this same, this same mutation is appearing independently in different places. And uh, as I told you, the, this is the UK variant 117 or the virus first detected in the UK. Uh, there is no difference between the, the old virus and the, and, the, and the mutant virus in being killed by the, the serum of different patients. But those viruses with this 484 a mutation, you can see the amount of neutralization is dropping. It's not gone, it's not zero, but it is less than with the older virus. So there is evidence that uh, these mutations, particularly the one in South Africa and probably the one in Brazil, are likely to be able to evade uh, past infection immunity and maybe vaccine immunity. And indeed, that is what was seen now from three vaccines. So the Novavax reported their study data they showed that in the UK, that vaccine had 98% efficacy, but in South Africa, it was only 60%, uh, and even excluding those with HIV. The Johnson & Johnson trial, uh, they carried out in the USA and in South Africa and in Latin America. In the USA, it was 72% effective. In South Africa, 57% effective. And you may have heard the last one or two days, AstraZeneca have reported that their vaccine seen has low efficacy against the South African mutant. So I think, um, you know, the bottom line is that that uh, these viruses are mutating and some of these mutations may lead to reduction in protection uh, of natural infection and vaccine. And I think, you know, certainly for Sri Lanka, it means that we really have to be very careful in preventing introduction of these viruses from outside because just because the virus is reported in South Africa doesn't mean it's only in South Africa. It is already now reported from many other places. So we really have to be careful about introducing, uh, allowing the introduction of these variants from outside. Um, I Again, I'll skip over this as to how these uh, arise and I will just summarize the issue of these viral variants. Uh, as I said, these some of them increase virus transmission. This 501 mutation appears to enhance binding to the receptor some of these uh, variants, particularly those with the 484 mutation, have some impact in reducing neutralizing activity of antibody to the old virus. 
Um, and uh, but having said all that, even though some of these new variants may be more transmissible, they transmit by the same routes, by the same means. So it still means that the same social distancing measures and personal protective uh, equipment uh, that we use will be effective. It's just that we have to be more careful, work harder to achieve the same levels of control. And of course, if we can reduce the virus circulation in the population, you also reduce the emergence of these mutants. And of the, the fact is that uh, we will need to be updating these vaccines from time to time to cover these new viral variants. But it's unlikely, I don't think, that we have to go to things like yearly vaccines, vaccinating like as we get with influenza. Um, so of course, also we have all these um, false news and rumors about vaccines that are being circulated, which you have to be careful about. And I just want to end, uh, I know we have been all focused on COVID-19, but I think COVID-19 is also a good lesson to humankind. Uh, I mean, I think we have all been taking things for granted. Uh, and I, I really like this uh, statement by this French philosopher microbiologist uh, from many decades ago, where he was talking um, about um, conquest of infectious disease. He said that, un that at, at some unpredictable time and in some unforeseeable manner, nature will strike back. And indeed, that is what we see with COVID-19. But I think it is not just COVID-19. I think we really have to think that uh, our whole lifestyle, uh, our whole economic models uh, are unsustainable, to put it shortly, in, in short. In nature, nothing grows forever. I mean, we cannot just as human, as mankind, womankind, we cannot just continue to expand our consumption uh, forever and ever. I mean, the, uh, the resources of the planet are limited. The capacity of the planet to absorb all the pollution that we are creating is limited. And as a number of people have said, um, and this is a very good book from Kate Raworth, who talks about sustainable economics and pointing out that the economic models that we are using, we are at the limits of what the planet can tolerate, whether it be uh, climate change, ozone layer depletion, air pollution, biodiversity loss, and, and so many things. So I think COVID-19 is probably a good uh, uh, lesson for all of us to think carefully about uh, what we are doing to the planet. Indeed, the emergence of infections like COVID-19 also is because of things like the wild game animal trade for food consumption. So um, I think COVID-19 is a warning and the best teaching opportunity for us to start acting against these other global challenges, because although these may be more insidious, less dramatic in the long run, they may be more, they will be more catastrophic. So to summarize, um, as I said, infectious, uh, the patients are infectious before and soon after symptom onset. Uh, our PCR does not necessarily mean the virus is infectious. Um, safe vaccines are becoming available. Uh, we talked about viral variants. Um, it may, some of them may be able to partially evade vaccine immunity and vaccines already are being developed to, to counter these. The importance of effective communication and in general terms, the need for effective research capacity, the fact that novel viruses and new pandemics and in fact, epidemics will continue to emerge from wild animals and domestic livestock the need for better preparedness to confront these emerging infectious diseases and the need to pay attention to these less dramatic threats such as climate change and environmental pollution. And the need for a multidisciplinary approach to deal with these. I mean, just because uh, we are doctors or medical students, we cannot assume that we as a profession can tackle all these problems because they really are multidisciplinary problems. And then coming back to the title, uh, of uh, light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, I do hope we are seeing some light at the end of the tunnel, but I think getting back to normal, I think we really have to consider whether the old normal was the normal we should aim to be at. And for the reasons that I told you, 
I think we need to think. I think there are many things we have learned during the pandemic, better ways to do things. I mean, for example, like this meeting and uh, without having to fly all the way to and, and pollute the planet to, to talk to you. Um, we, we can do a lot of things remotely and we need to try to, uh, uh, to get back to a better normal than just back to normal. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for your attention.